Today, we welcome, of course, Molly Crosby. It's an honor to have her with us. Before I forget to say this, she has brought books, and Molly is seated at the table before me. So after, after the, her presentation, if you want to come forward, she'll sign, and you can purchase um, a, an American Plague. And she's got two copies of The Great Pearl Heist, but both of those have already been purchased. So you'll have to get those on Amazon and track her down uh, elsewhere. And you can do that because Molly is a Memphian, so you can look for her around the, the, the city. She is, her most recent book that she's getting a lot of attention for is The Great Pearl Heist, but that is not while she is here. Her second book is a book called Asleep, The Forgotten Epidemic That Remains One of Medicine's Great Mysteries, but that is not why she is here, because her first book is why she is here, and that is An American Plague, The Untold Story of Yellow Fever, The Epidemic That Shaped Our History, and she is here to talk about not only the ways in which yellow fever affected the city, but the way it affected our Episcopalians, churches, and um, the incredible and heroic story of many of the Episcopalian priests and lay people and sisters of St. Mary's who stayed here through that epidemic. Molly, we're delighted to have you. Welcome to Grace St. Luke's. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to come speak here and to be part of this series. Uh, and I was just hearing the story behind the stained glass behind me, which is um, also really neat and fascinating for me to hear, given my research and the time I've spent um, really writing about and getting to know the people, the martyrs of Memphis, who stayed behind in the 1878 yellow fever epidemic. Um, I write in my book uh, that yellow fever was a disease that was intrinsically tied to the best and the worst in humanity. It would inspire racism and hatred in some, but it would also inspire heroism and martyrdom. For me, that is what the real story behind this disease is. It is the story of the martyrs. Martyrs who, in the spirit of Christ, would lay down their lives for others, and martyrs to medicine. Although my story begins in Memphis in 1878, it ends with the doctors who literally gave their lives to discover the cause of yellow fever. One doctor later said that he could think of no other disease that cost so many of the lives in the study of it. This morning, I want to tell you some of their stories. Um, Reverend Lawson was kind enough to share with me his presentation on Bishop Quintard last week, and I was surprised to learn that Quintard had once published a paper on yellow fever and that he was um, a physician. He believed, like many others, that Memphis was outside the range of yellow, fish, yellow fever, and he published that in 1854, which is somewhat prophetic because the first yellow fever epidemic or outbreak occurred here one year later in 1855, and his was an opinion that was held by many medical men at the time. After all, yellow fever was a plague of the port towns. It was rooted in the African slave trade, and it made its way to the Western Hemisphere on slave ships. In fact, every country that ever participated in the African slave trade would see epidemics of yellow fever, from Portugal to Wales to Russia. And it's really no great mystery that any time you introduce one group of people to another, you exchange microbes as well. Eventually, these transatlantic voyages allowed diseases like malaria and yellow fever that we typically consider to be tropical to spread to this part of the world and become endemic. Excuse me, I keep losing my voice. Once in this hemisphere, most epidemics of yellow fever would break out through the ship trade and they first hit the northern port towns in the U.S. Boston, New York, Philadelphia all suffered major outbreaks of yellow fever. And in fact, if you've ever visited Manhattan and walked through Washington Square Park, you walked over 22,000 yellow fever and cholera victims. Philadelphia suffered a terrible epidemic, one of the worst in history in 1793. At the time, the U.S. government was temporarily located there. It shut down the entire government. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson fled to their country homes. Alexander Hamilton suffered a case of the fever, but then later recovered. Philadelphia lost a tenth of its population and had to shut down for a full three months the federal government. Eventually, the capital was moved to D.C., where they hoped yellow fever would not be as likely. <laughs> Little did they realize it was a swamp that would, once again, have more yellow fever outbreaks. As slavery was abolished in the North, slave ships to cities like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia stopped, and so did the yellow fever epidemics. And it was then that the fever began to move south, using American progress as the means to do so. Expanding railroads and steamboats traveling along the Mississippi River would create new port towns, and it would enable the range of yellow fever to widen. It was through this infrastructure that yellow fever would deliver the worst epidemic in history, 
Memphis was a city considered too far from the coast to be a danger. It sat at the center of a major cross-section of train lines and boats, and like today, it was a hub. What Memphians did not know was how the city's place in geography would mark its tragic place in history. Prior to 1878, Memphis was a thriving city. It was the second largest city in the South, twice the size of Nashville or Atlanta. The city had fared very well during the Civil War, even working as a hospital center for soldiers. There was very little damage done to the city. And after the war, business flourished. The city had a diverse population of both Northerners and Southerners, many Northern officers who stayed after the war. And it was a city that seemed to bring people together, Northerners and Southerners, businessmen and boatmen, immigrants and plantation owners, black and white. Memphis, it seemed, had a very bright future. As the spring of 1878 approached, the mood in Memphis was celebratory. Preparations were underway for the extravagant Mardi Gras parade, rumored to be so impressive that New Orleans had sent some scouts north to study it. In fact, 1878 would be one of the grandest parades. Champagne would flow from the fountain in Court Square. Fireworks would light up the sky over the bluffs. Thousands of people would flood downtown for the parades. Memphians unpacked Confederate uniforms that had not been seen since the war and unearthed fine wines they had hidden during Yankee occupation. I'm going to do a short reading from the book um, that discusses Charles Parsons and kind of introduces him as a character, but it also sort of sets up the mood in Memphis as Mardi Gras is occurring in February 1878, and what a great contrast that would be to just six months later. Not everyone in Memphis would take part in Carnival, which is what Mardi Gras later became. After all, the city may have had 115 saloon keepers, 18 houses of prostitution, 3,000 rough roughly 3,000 dope addicts. It also had close to two dozen churches. The temperance supporters opposed the drinking that accompanied the festivities. Considered a heathen celebration, Mardi Gras was blasted from the pulpit with predictions of wrath and doom. Colonel Charles Parsons preached no such warnings, however. One week before the parade was to begin, Charles Carroll Parsons stood in full uniform before the Chickasaw Guards, a civilian military corps, as their chaplain. In fact, the Chickasaw Guards would be among the local corps to march in the parade. <clears throat> Parsons was a lean man with a soldier's build. He had carved cheekbones, fair hair, a handlebar mustache, and a tender smile. His eyes were deep set and gave the appearance of sincerity, but there was also something intense in his expression. He was once described as having a look of near fanaticism in his face, a passion for what he believed to be his calling and duty. Not a single surviving letter describes him as anything other than gentle and great. And in spite of being a Yankee, Parsons was one of the most beloved rectors in Memphis. During the war, Parsons had been a northern officer and a hero. At the Battle of Perryville in Kentucky, he continued operating a gun single-handedly after all officers and men in his company had fallen. When the Confederate artillery approached, Parsons held his sword at parade rest and awaited fire. The Confederate colonel, impressed by his courage, ordered his men to hold their fire and allowed Parsons to walk off the battlefield. That man, the colonel exclaimed, is too brave to be killed. After the war, Charles Parsons taught at West Point and served with General George Custer in the Western campaigns. Custer, a friend and admirer, tried to persuade Parsons to remain in the military, but Parsons felt a different calling. He soon took orders as an Episcopal priest from Tennessee Bishop Charles T. Quintard, another veteran of the Battle of Perryville, the one who fought on the other side. Parsons came to Memphis to grieve the loss of his first wife, who died in childbirth, and start anew as rector for Grace Church, where this union officer now preached to a congregation that included Jefferson Davis and his family. On that late day in February 1878, in a city filled with the sound of hammers and the scent of lumber, Parsons preached not about heathen celebrations or temperance, but about the character of men. There will come a time to each of you, he said, when the scourge of affliction may fall heavily upon you, Wealth or power or skill can supply no companion to the soul in its journey through the valley of death. He spoke with the confidence of a soldier who had survived the Civil War, the death of a wife, and the loss of a son to scarlet fever. For all intents and purposes, he had been to that valley and returned. Parsons did not know at that moment what lay ahead, that the greatest urban disaster to date awaited them, that when the fever would finally take him, he would have to read his own last rites. The room was still, as Parsons spoke, of measuring a man's spirit and strength against the darkest moments. And then he ended his sermon. I was about to say God send us such a man, 
I think it's better that I pray, God make us to be such. As Mardi Gras came to a close that year and the planting season began, people were already beginning to notice the unusual weather. It had been warm since February. Daffodils and tulips came up early. The weather was unseasonably pleasant. The only complaints were for the mosquitoes, already beginning to swarm. River traffic crowded the Mississippi all of that spring, with shipments from New Orleans to the Caribbean and South America. One such shipment was a load of sugar arriving from Havana, Cuba. As the ship came into port, it stopped at the quarantine station outside of New Orleans. Worried about delaying the shipment and spending the next month languishing with the yellow jack flag flying overhead, the captain lied to the quarantine officer about a couple of passengers who had symptoms of fever. Days later, when cases began appearing in New Orleans, the health department, fearful of quarantine, also kept quiet. New Orleans continued to send steamboats up the Mississippi all spring and well into the summer. It was a full two months later before Memphis finally knew there was an epidemic in New Orleans. It was the end of July, and by then at least two dozens of uh, yellow fever had made their way silently into downtown Memphis. Like New Orleans, Memphis kept quiet about the news. The city feared being quarantined and halting commerce for a full three months. City health officials bickered over whether or not to impose their own quarantine or to focus their efforts on sanitation and try to clean up in hopes of preventing the spread of the fever. After all, at this point in time, new, no one knew what caused yellow fever or why it continually struck American cities during their summer months. Finally, city health officials felt obligated to report the fevers to the public. The appeal first published news of a single case in the Pinch District, and within five days, half the population of Memphis fled. That was roughly 25,000 people on trains, boats, and anything they could to get out of the city. As September of 1878 arrived, there were 19,000 people left in Memphis. 17,000 of them had yellow fever. The city was overwhelmed in every sense of the word. There were simply too many sick and too few who were well. Grocery stores and banks had closed. Pharmacists were scarce. There were not even enough grave diggers. Families would hang a black piece of paper with the dimensions needed for a coffin on their front doors. And once a day, a wagon would roll up the street and someone would call, bring out your dead. Each day, doctors set out the few medicines they had to try and help fever victims. Priests and nuns visited homes to offer whatever help or comfort they could give. More than once, they arrived at a house to find the parents dead and the children still sitting beside them. To understand how yellow fever could devastate a community so completely, to understand the sacrifice made by Memphians, you first have to understand what those doctors, nurses, priests, and nuns faced each day. Yellow fever is a hemorrhagic virus. That puts it in the same category as Ebola. I apologize for doing this right after breakfast, but <laughs> there's really no other way around it. <laughs> what that means is the virus attacks several different organs as well as blood vessels. For the people in Memphis, the fever would begin with a pounding headache, and quickly a fever could escalate as high as 105 or 106 degrees. As the virus attacked the blood vessels, bleeding began internally and was digested and produced the telltale black vomit so common to yellow fever victims. It also led to external bleeding, causing the nose, nose, mouth, eyes, even bruises to bleed. Finally, the virus attacked the liver, which released a surge of bile that turned the skin and eyes jaundiced, giving the fever its name. In most yellow fever epidemics, there's a 20% mortality. That is even the case today, meaning that 20% of the people who catch that fever will die. For reasons we still don't fully understand, in 1878, it had a mortality of 80%. That is what the martyrs of Memphis were facing. In my book, I tell the story of these men and women. In their spare moments, which were few, they wrote letters to families or kept diaries. Many were part of the community at St. Mary's Episcopal Cathedral. One was a nun named Sister Constance. She had been born Caroline Louise Darling, and she returned to Memphis from a vacation and arrived right in the midst of this epidemic. She volunteered to come back and help. She was 32, 32 years old and a lovely young woman with striking blue eyes. She was described as a woman with exquisite grace. She kept a diary of her daily events here, and I was struck by the fact that she could write about entering a house full of corpses and rescue an orphan child and still notice a beautiful sunset over the river on her way home. She took a lot of risks in her work. She saved many lives, and her diary came to an abrupt end in September. When she died, the other sisters laid roses across her breast and held her body in a borrowed vault until they could find grave diggers to bury her. Another priest I write about 
was a young man named Lewis Schuyler. He was emotionally fragile, but was inspired when he read about the priests and nuns at St. Mary's. He came here from the north to fill the vacancy led by dead priests and to offer his services to a group of dying nuns. He survived less than a week. When his feverish screams became too loud, he was moved out of the infirmary into the death alley while he was still alive. A nurse followed him and knelt down to wait with the dying man, promising not to leave his side. And finally, Charles Parsons. He wrote to his wife every night during the epidemic until his letters came to a halt. He stayed in good spirits through his illness and refused to let any of the nurses or nuns waste their time caring for him. In the end, he spoke of his wife and children and said that he was ready to be taken away from this place. Where do you wish to go, the nurse asked him. Parsons signed himself with the cross and mumbled, we receive this child into the congregation of Christ's flock and do sign him with the sign of the cross. Still more would die. These were martyrs in the truest sense of the word. Their stories would be forgotten to history few would ever know of their sacrifice. The statistics from the 18 yellow fever ep epidemic are harrowing. In Memphis alone, over 5,000 people died, including the majority of those doctors, nurses, nuns, and priests. To put that in perspective today, that's more people than were killed in Pearl Harbor, more than died on 9-11, more than died during Hurricane Katrina. In the Mississippi Valley, there were over 100,000 cases and 20,000 deaths. The 1878 yellow fever epidemic changed Memphis forever. Even to this day, we're the only city that has lost such a dramatic amount of its population in what time? 50%. In addition to losing so many people, it lost much of its diversity as Irish, German, and Eastern European immigrant populations were decimated or moved away and didn't return. Many of the businessmen who fled relocated to St. Louis, Chicago, or Atlanta. Many of the wealthiest families moved away and never returned. With so few people left to pay taxes, the city voted away its own charter on December 31st of 1878. It would not regain it for another 12 years. But the epidemic also changed the nation. At the time, there was no FEMA. There was no one to come in and help people. Rutherford B. Hayes created the National Board of Health in response to this epidemic. They held their first meeting in December of that year at the Peabody Hotel. Mm -hmm. After the 1878 epidemic, yellow fever seemed to disappear from major American cities and we still really don't know the reason why. In part, it was because the devastation of Memphis led to so many changes in sanitation and clean water systems. They didn't know it at the time, but by cleaning up the streets, they did away with a number of breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Even things as simple as plumbing had an effect. Without water, water cisterns sitting around homes, the mosquito had fewer places to breed. And it wasn't until 1898, 20 years later, that yellow fever came to the attention of the United States again. That is the story of the second half of my book, and I'll t give you just a short recap of it this morning. The Spanish-American War was costing many American lives, but not from combat. For every soldier who died from a bullet, seven had already died of disease. The U.S. government sent a group of doctors to Cuba to study what was causing the spread of yellow fever, which was the number one killer. Much like Memphis, their story is one of sacrifice and martyrdom. To head the commission, they chose a frontier army doctor named Walter Reed, Reed and his men conducted one of the most controversial medical studies in history. They not only self-infected to prove their theory that mosqu mosquitoes spread yellow fever, but one of the doctors died from a terrible case of the fever, leaving a child and a pregnant wife at home in Baltimore. And then they launched human trials. These were healthy young soldiers who had survived the war. They then volunteered for an incurable and hideous disease for the sake of medicine. With hindsight, and today people can judge them, History asks how we could ever use human volunteers in the study of any disease. Mm -hmm. I say they need only read the letters, diaries, and newspaper accounts of Memphians in 1878 to answer those questions. The work of Walter Reed and his human trials would eventually lead to the development of a vaccine some 20 years later. On the surface, I will tell you that my book is something of a cautionary tale. Even though we have a vaccine today, there is still no cure for yellow fever. We're no better off treating it today than we were in 1878. And we are seeing outbreaks of yellow fever in several countries in Africa and South America. In fact, the World Health Organization considers even one case to be epidemic and requires reporting of only three diseases, plague, cholera, and yellow fever. Here in the US, the mosquito that carries the virus thrives. In another couple of weeks, you'll be swatting at its small striped body. But that's not what the book is really about. I tell the story of an epidemic, a virus, a vaccine, but truthfully, this is a story much less about the nature of disease and much more about the nature of humanity.
One of the greatest experiences I had in writing this book was when an NPR reporter came to Memphis to interview me. We spent the day together visiting Elmwood, and we sat in St. Mary's Cathedral. The organist was practicing for the weekend services. The church historian was giving an interview to the reporter, and I sat in a pew. I sat looking at Charles Parsons' stole framed on the wall, listening to the organ play box, Jesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, reading Constance's last words inscribed in stone. For me personally, this is a book about inspiration. I will never be able to fathom the courage, bravery, and strength that it took those martyrs of Memphis to stay in the city. But it does show me what it is truly to lay down your life for another. And this story has shown me the real meaning of sacrifice and of grace. Thank you again for having me this morning, and I'd be happy to answer questions about this epidemic, the effect on Memphis, or anything else I can answer. <laughs> Arsenic was one of them. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, in 1878, with the virulency of that epidemic, that they still don't fully know why. Um, it's hard to say whether or not any of their treatments were helpful because some of the side effects, from what I understand, of arsenic and <laughs> things they were treating them with can also be um, hemorrhaging, high fevers, um, stomach problems, delirium, a lot of the same symptoms that the patients were having here. And I think in large part, um, some of the high death toll was just due to neglect. With so few people to take care of them, Sorry if this is ringing. Um, they, a lot of people died from starvation, from dehydration, um, no one being able to get them. So I don't really know if there's an accurate way to say whether or not the treatments made it worse, better, or helped. Um, in the cases in Havana, they were, because it was a group of physicians and it was kind of a controlled environment, they were doing a, a very good job of making sure the patients were well cared for. Um, you know, no dehydration, none of the, the starvation issues that they were having here in Memphis. And as a result, they had very good um, case reports, nobody, they didn't lose anyone in the study of it there. But they were also care careful to choose people under the age of 40 because they had shown in studies that it was a, had a higher mortality rate among people over the age of 40. Uh, so they were using healthy young volunteers, and that also probably helped with the outcome. Can yes. you tell the story of the St. Mary's girl who was named the nurse with Walter Reed? Yes, Lena Warner. Um, she's, she, I write about her story in the prologue of the book because it was just an interesting and neat way to me to connect the two stories. Um, this, I wanted to tell the story of Memphis to really for people to understand what the inside of an epidemic looked like, what it was really doing to American cities, and that makes the work of Walter Reed all the more poignant. So Lena was a good bridge between these two stories. Um, she was an eight-year-old girl who was found by an old family slave um, in a plantation house. She had been boarded up there. Her father had moved her and her sisters out of the city when the epidemic broke out. Um, they had all been closing up their windows, as people tended to do, to try to keep out the pestilence. Instead, they were closing in mosquitoes. Um, within a few days, Lena's father and all of her siblings had died, and the slave found her. He pried open a window and found her just barely still alive. She was taken to Memphis. She was nursed back to health um, by grandparents, I believe, that were here. Uh, she was sent to St. Mary's School, incidentally. <laughs> she also became a nurse. Um, and in 1900, 20 years later, she, was, uh, she volunteered for the U.S. government to go down there and work because she was immune. Once having survived a case of yellow fever, you're immune for the rest of your life. So she volunteered to go, and she was one of the nurses helping out in, in Walter Reed's work. Um, that's as accurate of the story as I could find in the research. It was also, um, there were all, all kinds of things 
claimed that sometimes it's hard as a historian to verify, um, including that she had her own kidney stones in one night and performed a tonsillectomy with a spoon. So <laughs> that's one of the dangers of trying to research based on um, people's stories. Sometimes they can get a little exaggerated. <laughs> Uh, I, I did not grow up in Memphis originally. I'm from Texas. I married a Memphian, which is how I ended up here. And I went to undergraduate at Rhodes College. So I was familiar with the city. Um, and I had wanted to be a writer since I was a child. I just didn't really know what um, avenue that would take. So after college, I worked at National Geographic Magazine in Washington, D.C., um, thinking I would go into magazine journalism. And at the same time, um, got my graduate degree in nonfiction and science writing at Johns Hopkins. So I think the combination of that and then also working at National Geographic where I did a lot of research for uh, their science and medical writers sort of piqued an interest for me um, in writing about disease, studying disease. Um, it's always sort of fascinated me. And I loved this uh, particular genre, narrative nonfiction, where you get to use a lot of creativity um, in the writing even though everything remains factual. You're creative in the kind of research you can find and the way you can pull together the story, the facts, to, to bring a story to life. Um, so for me, that was the great niche um, and what I enjoy doing. I think so, yes. Um, it, yeah, and I think also as a historian, it's you can't really take a piece of history um, in a vacuum. You, you have to look at uh, the, the religious aspects of the time period, the politics, the history of a place, people, um, all of those things sort of come together to create the story. Yes. It was interesting, I was writing this um, and still working on it when Hurricane Katrina hit. And um, so there were a lot of parallels that I could see at the time, including um, the fact that the people who were left behind in the city just couldn't afford to leave, was usually the case. Um, they were even blamed by the mayor for staying behind and costing valuable lives who stayed to take care of them when really, much like Hurricane Katrina, they didn't really, they didn't have a choice in that. Um, it also, yellow fever tended to have a lot of racism tied to it. Because it was part of the African slave trade, because its origins came from Africa, there was a natural immunity. There tended to be a natural immunity among the black community. And then it was easy to blame, you know, like they brought it here, or, you know, when in truth it was coming on board the, the ships, um, even the mosquitoes, you know, this, this mosquito that spreads it is not um, endemic to this part of the world. It came aboard ships um, and made its way here. So uh, there was, a, I think it was steeped in a lot of racism um, in the treatment. And I, that was reflected in reading newspaper accounts of it. And I just tried to, you know, weed through that <laughs> and get to the real story. Um, but it also then affected the demographics of the city in general because, as I mentioned, anyone who had had money fled. Um, and once people were starting to come back and businesses were starting to come back, um, another epidemic hit in 1879, not as bad, but the mosquitoes had just wintered over because it was another mild winter. And at that point, <clears throat> then a lot of people just stayed away for good. They considered Memphis kind of a lost cause. Um, so in the epilogue, I really write about the fact that Memphis's demographics, how much of the city was changed, um, and how much of the resiliency that you see today in Memphis and the kind of this will to keep improving, keep surviving, is essentially kind of, I would argue, goes its roots from this uh, particular epidemic. One good thing that came out of it was the first black millionaire, Robert Church. He bought up um, property on Beale Street as people fled the city. <coughs> yes? Uh, you speak of two epidemics and those of me who's able to live in the city and city of Memphis and Tug. Mm -hmm. Obviously the city came back and thrived and it's a wonderful place that I like to call home. Did the martyrs and those that could not afford to leave, were they the driving force behind what made the city come back? That's a good question. I don't really know how to answer that. I do think a lot of people, um, as I mentioned sort of in the, the epilogue, as an outsider, not born and bred here, I do see um, just this very strong sense of community, community, trying to take care of your own, trying to be a very, it's a city to me that's rooted in survival. So 
I certainly see that coming out of the 1880s and 90s, but Memphis did have a, a big comeback. A lot of American cities in that time period um, started to figure out the water systems. They cleaned up the cities. Cities started to grow at a rapid rate. And that's why if you look around Midtown, so many of these neighborhoods and things were built and churches were built right around that time, early 1900s on into the 1920s. You see the city building up. The sad thing as a historian's perspective is to realize how far Memphis came only to be dropped back down again after the shooting of Martin Luther King. So it's you kind of look around and just think, wow, the city is amazingly resilient considering what it's been through. Not a lot. I have um, a 10-year-old and 7-year-old daughters, and so it's hard for me to be away for any big length of time. Um, in fact, someone was asking me if I'm working on my next book right now, and I said, I've had three books and two kids in 10 years, <laughs> so <laughs> slowing things down a little bit. Um, I'm very fortunate in this day and age, so much of the research is available online, um, and even with Walter Reed, for example, all of his work, all of his letters, studies, everything were scanned in online through the University of Virginia. So. Um, most of the time I'm able to go on a short research trip, collect material, and then come back. Uh, that was the case with the Great Pearl Heist. Scotland Yard um, archives are all held there, and I went, kind of went through, which was a lot of fun as a researcher, just to sit and dig around in Scotland Yard archives from the era where these were the detectives in the Jack the Ripper cases and all the Victorian London murderers. Um, and then they copied them and mailed them to me here, so I was able to do a lot of work. So two short trips to London. Um, and that is another question people often ask is I've done two books. The first two books were medical history and disease, um, but this third one is such a departure. <laughs> it, it was a nice welcome change from some of the more sad uh, tragedies I had written about. Yes? They were. The whole Mississippi Valley was very hardly hit, and it wasn't just along um, the river. It was also towns, the trains. If you follow, like, Grand Junction, Tennessee, it was very hard hit. Um, Holly Springs, Mississippi, was another one very hard hit. They didn't know at the time, but it really was tracing. It was following these um, shipments of goods because the mosquitoes could survive for several days, um, even in a trunk of clothes or just on board, or the people were traveling. Um, they would, it would take several days for the, before they would show symptoms of yellow fever, so they would be spreading it. Um, and it, it created a mass fear here at the time. They had shotgun quarantines. They blew up some train tracks and bridges trying to prevent Memphians from getting out of the city. Uh, so they could definitely see the spread and how it was occurring. I believe in that year they had cases as far no north as uh, Cincinnati, but for the most part it was centered in the Mississippi Valley. Um, there, the Memphis historian Charles Crawford has said we would be Atlanta essentially. He said Atlanta could, you know, we um, Atlanta can thank the Aedes aegypti mosquito for um, its present position as the New York of the South. Um, so I do think it was uh, because we had come out of the Civil War so well. We were a city that was perched to really um, take off. Had it not been for this, um, and, and as I mentioned, that harrowing statistic: there's no other city in American history to lose 50 percent of its population at one single time. Um, so it took probably 20 to 30 years to rebuild um, that population and bring people back. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Just to let you, you mentioned your first two books um, are involved with disease research and then Great Pearl Heist. I'm wondering what direction you're going next. I don't, I don't know just yet. I found the Great Pearl Heist story when I was still researching my second book, Asleep, um, which is about sleeping sickness uh, cases, an epidemic of it that occurred sort of in the wake of the Spanish flu in World War I. So I had ran, ran across the, the story of this great necklace heist um, in researching that, looking for cases in, in the London Times. And the story just really appealed to me. I, I don't think my, my background is, or I don't think I'm going to stay particularly with medical history, although I'm fascinated by it. I just like history in general. And this story appealed to me on many levels because it was, um, it had a natural history element. It was the, the most valuable necklace in the world at the time were pearls um, because they had not yet cultured pearls, so they were more valuable than diamonds. Um, my background at National Geographic, that was interesting, appealing to me, um, but also it's the beginning of the detective units at Scotland Yard, and the idea of a detective was still very new, so there were a lot of elements to that historically that appealed to me, but I do like that time period a lot. I'm sort of fascinated by 
the World War I era, it's a little easier to research than the 1870s. <laughs> There's more photographs and more material. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my favorite is Eric Larson. I've always enjoyed his books. Um, and part of what inspired me to want to write this one was in reading narrative nonfiction, they so often focus stories on a natural disaster. Um, and one of his first books, Isaac Storm, focused on the 1900 er hurricane in Galveston. Um, and then, of course, there's other books written about, you know, great fires and um, floods and earthquakes. And so <coughs> what one of the things that inspired me to write the story was not only the fact that people outside of Memphis didn't know about it, and that amazed me, given the high death toll, um, but also that I wanted to show the way epidemics were once like natural disasters. Um, we're sort of lulled into a, a quiet time now with vaccines and with you know a fair amount of disease control that we've never experienced anything like that. Um, but for the 19th, 18th centuries, epidemics were every bit like a major natural, disa natural disaster. And to me, that also highlights the heroism involved because nowadays if there's you know, something like a hurricane, people go in after the fact when the danger is past. Uh, during an epidemic, they're going in in the thick of it and very often losing their own lives to help. Are there any other questions? I saw someone raise. Mm -hmm. Holly, one of the questions is in the lab. You mm -hmm. got some bodies and things that seem hard to say when they're gone. Mm -hmm. I think at the time it was very hard to see. Um, at the Memphis had had an 1873 um, outbreak of yellow fever. Many of the martyrs that I write about, um, Dr. William Armstrong, who was the physician seeing the St. Mary's Cathedral area, um, Constance Thecla, two of the sisters that were, um, and I, I believe Parsons too, may have been here during 1873, and they all survived. So they were looking at this, I think, more as, well, here's another yellow fever epidemic. It's our duty to go back and serve. They had no idea at the virulency um, and that it was killing people so quickly that they finally started sending people to the trains and saying, don't let anyone come, especially people from the north who tended to have um, less, uh, not, they didn't have an immunity, but they'd never been exposed to southern fevers before. Uh, so they tended to die like Lewis Schuyler in less than a week um, and became a burden on the city. So it's, it's really hard to say from the inside of that epidemic or the outside looking in what um, would drive a person to want to come back or drive a person to want to stay away. And nearly everyone who was here, like Dean George Harris, who was running St. Mary's at the time, he came down with yellow fever. He was sent away from the city. He, he later recovered, but Parsons, so many of them didn't. And I'm sure Quintard's efforts, fundraising, getting people to send supplies, um, you know, was helpful in a, just an entirely different way. Uh, he, if he had come here, he most likely would have died. He could have taken care of people for a couple of weeks and then you know, so it's hard to say what his efforts, how you measure that. Mm -hmm. How long did it last? It started, the, the silent cases were in the end of July when they started reporting. The health department have records of people who were dying of fevers. Um, and it's both in New Orleans and in Memphis, it's um, surprising that they wouldn't go ahead and list it as yellow fever, yellow fever because there's very other few other diseases that would turn anyone bright yellow like that. One New Orleans doctor described it as canary yellow. Um, so if they were jaundiced, that would have been evident. That started end of July. First case was reported mid-August, and it really isn't until the first frost, um, end of October, early November, when the mosquitoes started to die off that the major cases, or the major outbreaks stopped. I think September was the height of it, and they were losing about 200 people a day. Um, so it was really just following the mosquitoes. But again, a mild winter just set off a new string of cases again by that spring. I think the last reported case, though, was into December, so it was a good three-month period. Any other questions? I don't want to hold up church. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thank you.